Hello and welcome to lecture number 25. I'm going to continue our lecture from last time. Uh, we were talking about um, morphine and opioid pain relievers. We're going to continue talking about those opioid and opiate pain relievers, uh, focusing on those narcotic pain relievers, and then finish up with some addiction and treatment options. Uh, so that'll be some important information. Uh, please remember, these lectures are for educational purposes. Uh, consult your physician or pharmacist for any questions about medications you may be taking. Uh, the profession, everything presented here is based on peer-reviewed scientific evidence. Um, I often provide those citations, but not always. And I'll provide some resources at the end. Let's continue what we were talking about uh, in the previous lecture. We just finished talking about uh, morphine. The uh, next derivative of uh, opium poppies is codeine. It's certainly one of the most commonly prescribed medications, usually combined with aspirin or acetaminophen for relief of mild to moderate pain. As a high degree of dependency, about 40% of users will become dependent on this drug. Uh, this particular drug is metabolized into morphine by the cytochrome P2D6, and so those clinical effects tend to be due to morphine. Now, we'll talk here in a little bit about some variations on that particular um, enzyme in the gene that codes for that enzyme. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, enzyme itself can also be blocked by certain selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So those um, SSRIs can block metabolism of codeine into morphine, and so you want to talk with your doctor about uh, all the drugs that you're taking if this is a drug that you will be taking for. Heroin is, of course, the um, primary drug of abuse in this class. Um, it's three times more potent, potent than morphine. It has uh, much greater lipid solubility, which results in rapid crossing of the blood-brain barrier. That's why people get a big rush or high that is far more immediate and potent than morphine. And this is where we get back to basic learning principles. Um, that injection of that drug is associated with that really sudden high. And so that reward is associated with that behavior a great deal more than it is with some of these other drugs. It's entirely illegal in the United States. It's the Schedule One narcotic, no medical use uh, whatsoever. People will sometimes mix heroin with cocaine, and it's called speedball. We talked a bit about that in the lecture on cocaine. Uh, the effects offset one another, but create a serious multi-drug addiction that is difficult to treat. So there's going to be... Um, certainly quite a different high associated with that, and it's particularly dangerous. So please be mindful. Hydromorphone and oxymorphone. Uh, hydromorphone is Dilaudid, structure related to morphine. It's about six times as potent. It's often referred to as synthetic heroin. Long-acting versions of these drugs are available for treating chronic pain in those sensitized to opiates. Um, so these are uh, potential drugs uh, uh, for use in um, Chronic pain patients, a lot of it is certainly used clinically uh, in some areas. Aperidine is also Demerol. It's also potentially addictive. Uh, it's generally used as an intramuscular preparation for use in clinics. I can tell you from experience, it's very painful. Um, so it's, a, it's use as a, a drug of abuse is a little bit limited by that particular phenomenon. Um, but it certainly is often used uh, as a pre Methadone is primarily used to treat heroin addiction or other opiate addiction. Uh, it covers and blocks the effects of heroin withdrawal, so it is a mu agonist opioid. Um, it's effective in treating chronic pain. It's about one-tenth as potent as morphine, so it potentially has that use. Um, about one-third of heroin addicts experience withdrawal uh, from uh, methadone. So uh, these non-holders, uh, or sorry, withdrawal when taking methadone. Sorry. Uh, we call those non-holders. So methadone is often used as a treatment for a heroin. You probably heard of methadone clinics. There's usually a lot of um, clinics around those. Uh, the problem is, is that users usually have to come in every day uh, as they're trying to um, complete their treatment and uh, get the withdrawal over from heroin. Oxycodone, um, Oxycontin, Percodan. This is a semi-synthetic opioid similar to morphine. This is the drug that has been sort of wreaking havoc across areas. I know in um, the Appalachian region they call it hillbilly heroin. Uh, it was intended as a slow-release pain reliever for treatment of chronic pain, Oxycontin was, um, but then people discovered that if you crushed it and snorted it, it was uh, much more 
uh, readily uh, available to create a high. Um, so people usually crush and snort or then dilute and inject it to sort of trigger that time release mechanism. And so some of the uh, attempts at this point to limit the abuse of these drugs has to do with making them more difficult to crush, making them so um, they're not water soluble, so injecting them or snorting them won't be as effective, uh, but that's generally what's happened. Now, one of the problems with this particular drug is people become addicted to it and then discover they can't find it or it's more expensive, so they switch to heroin because it's cheaper. And so that's a huge problem. This is a drug there's a lot of controversy around because there are a lot of pain clinics in some areas, particularly places like West Virginia, um, where there was far more oxycontin being sent to West Virginia than there were people, um, which is pretty remarkable. Hydrocodone, uh, there's a common synthetic codeine used to treat mild or moderate pain. It's metabolized into hydromorphone, and so that's where you get that pain again. That's that cytochrome P226. It's usually combined with acetaminophen, Lortab uh, is uh, an example, and Percocet. Uh, this is a commonly abused drug because it's pretty readily available. Um, so they can be particularly addictive and certainly abused. One of the biggest problems with them is that it contains acetaminophen, and acetaminophen has a high degree of hepatotoxicity. And so people that are taking a lot of this drug uh, oftentimes have severe liver damage because Tylenol or acetaminophen can cause pretty severe um, liver toxicity. Fentanyl is, of course, another drug that we're hearing a great deal about in the current climate because it's just appearing in so many places. Um, it's available as an injectable or as a transdermal patch, as lollipops, as a dissolvable tablet. One of the issues with fentanyl is that it can very rapidly cross uh, the skin in a transdermal administration, and so people that touch um, things that have been coated with fentanyl oftentimes can get dosed with fentanyl. Uh, it does have long-term pain relief properties. It is a potent narcotic with a high risk of respiratory failure and dependence. Uh, one of the issues we've been seeing lately is heroin and even cocaine uh, tainted with fentanyl, uh, causing fentanyl overdose uh, in uh, a number of patients. Uh, in uh, clinical use, it's often used in conjunction with midazolam, which we'll talk about um, when we get to uh, sedatives, but it's used in these con in what are called conscious sedation procedures. Uh, so the midazolam is uh, anti-anxiety and also causes you to not remember anything that happens during the procedure, but it might be a procedure you need to be awake for, and then the fentanyl uh, makes it so that you don't experience any pain. So for example, if you're having your wisdom teeth extracted, you kind of have to be awake for that. Um, but <clears throat> what they'll do is they'll give you uh, this combination of drugs and then you won't experience any pain and you won't remember uh, the procedure. Uh, the biggest issue with fentanyl, it is, is lethal in relatively low doses, particularly in people who have sort of an, are, nar are narcotic naive. And as a result, it can be particularly lethal. So this is one of these areas where we're really having a problem uh, with drugs of abuse. Buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist, um, and this is, I think, uh, for my money, an exciting drug for treating opioid addiction. Uh, it's used in subutext. Um, it has a um, sort of ceiling to its analgesic effects. Uh, some common side effects include flu-like symptoms, but it's a possible medication for treating heroin addiction. And subutex, or no, sorry, suboxone, um, is combined with buprenorphine uh, along with uh, naloxone. And so what happens then is heroin users don't experience uh, withdrawal because of the buprenorphine, but because it also contains naloxone, if they do abuse, they're going to get nothing out of them because that naloxone is going to block the effects of the withdrawal. Tramadol is another um, potential uh, partial opioid agonist. It has a dual analgesic action. It actually works on norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake. Um, and the problem with tramadol is taken in conjunction with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, you can get uh, what's called serotonin syndrome, and we'll talk more about that when we get to antidepressants. So tramadol is a potential drug. People trying to avoid uh, the standard opiates, it has low abuse potential, um, and certainly can be um, useful. There are three clinically available pure opioid antagonists, which all block the receptors. Uh, Narcan or naloxone is injectable. It's also available as a nasal spray. 
used to treat opioid intoxication, and, but will precipitate withdrawal. So anytime uh, you may be involved uh, in uh, administering Narcan to somebody, uh, you want to make sure that you call 911 right away. Naxone is orally absorbed. Uh, it's used uh, in chronic therapy to event, prevent opioid relapse. And then nalmaphene uh, is an injectable to treat narcotic overdose uh, induced respiratory failure. But Narcan is the one that we see the most uh, because it's really easy to administer, and we'll talk about its administration uh, here in just a bit. Uh, it is uh, an important thing to understand uh, how it works and understand that it will precipitate withdrawal, and so calling 911 is an important thing. So that gets us to naloxone for opioid overdose. Um, so it can be safely administered as an intramuscular injection uh, via IV and as a nasal spray. And so uh, the biggest thing to keep in mind is the most often people will have the nasal spray, but if it's an IM injection, uh, any muscle will do, leg muscle, arm muscle, um, and uh, you can just inject it right into the muscle. Um, the effect is rapid. Those IM injections have longer duration of efficacy. Estimating the appropriate dose is difficult. Uh, it can cause elevation in blood pressure. Um, most kits contain 0.4 milligrams per milliliter, and the dosage will depend on the body weight and dose of the opioid. I looked at some of the uh, instructions, and usually they come with, as I recall, it was two uh, nasal sprays. Um, and you administer the first and then the second if they don't respond, I can't recall. Um, but again, this is a time is critical kind of thing. Administer it and call 911 right away. I uh, do want to talk for a moment about genetic opioid metabolic defects. Um, the cytochrome P450, 2D6, and 3A4 isoenzymes account for over 90% of opiate metabolism. Um, but what's interesting is uh, not everyone has the sort of same genetic makeup of this. We call it the gen genetic opioid metabolic defect uh, in, in one of these enzymes. So we have rapid and ultra metabolizers. Um, and what can happen with the rapid ultra metabolizers is they can um, end up creating so much hydromorphone, for example, from hydrocodone uh, that they overdose. Um, but it's also possible that we have uh, sort of non-metabolizers uh, that aren't metabolizing the drugs out. Um, and so they're bypassing that cytochrome P450 system. And as a result um, of repeated administration, uh, they can end up in overdose. You can actually check um, your uh, genetics of this particular uh, defect uh, through the 23andMe uh, health report. It's been added to that recently. Uh, tolerance of these drugs, we get progressive failure of receptors to initiate um, a signal. So the receptors are desensitized. That's in chronic use. Uh, for intermittent use, little if any tolerance develops and they retain their initial efficacy. Um, so these drugs are really particularly effective for occasional use for pain. Uh, they are not meant to be chronically used except for in the critically ill. Uh, terminally ill, I should say. Um, tolerance may become so marked that massive doses have to be administered uh, to either maintain a degree of euphoria or prevent withdrawal discomfort. In um, terminal patients, uh, the amount of morphine uh, or fentanyl administered uh, would be lethal to almost anyone because they've often been taking it for days and weeks, sometimes even months, then uh, those high doses are required. Physical dependence is that altered physiological state induced by the drug. Um, withdrawal elicits these biological reactions, uh, which are generally the opposite of the pharmacological effects. Magnitude will depend on dose, frequency, and duration of drug dependency. So the longer you have been using a drug, the higher the doses you've been using, the more frequently you've been using, the greater the dependency. <coughs> So a couple of ways to assist in withdrawal. There's one called clonidine-assisted detoxification, uh, buprenorphine-assisted detox, and rapid anesthesia-aided detoxification. And the anesthesia-aided de detoxification is essentially they put you under using um, something like propofol, 
um, allow you to detox and sleep through the whole thing. Abstinence syndrome will include depression, anxiety, and drug craving that may last for some time. Um, so uh, in addition to the detoxification, there'll need to be some additional um, intervention along with um, So the acute effects of opioids and the rebound withdrawal symptoms. So the analgesia, once you've taken that away, you can get pain and irritability. You can get hyperventilation because you no longer have depression. Um, increased blood pressure, um, all sorts of changes in um, physiological properties. So for every sort of reaction, there's an opposite reaction. So with the acute action, you get the withdrawal sign. If you take these drugs, uh, you really get a serious amount of uh, withdrawal. So uh, we've really reached an epidemic proportion of um, opioid deaths. Um, there were 47,600 overdose, uh, overdose deaths in 2017 from these drugs. Um, so we get a reduction in use of prescription drugs, but an increase in heroin use over these years. So if we look at uh, all overdose deaths, um, and the opioid-related deaths, um, you can see a pretty dramatic increase in uh, opioid-related deaths versus non-opioid-related deaths. Um, there has been another uptick in um, methamphetamine of, uh, overdose deaths. I just saw uh, recently that a number of jurisdictions are reporting that a methamphetamine has overtaken opioids in um, overdose um, fatalities. Um, so if we look at uh, deaths from opioid pain relievers, uh, the most at-risk group from death from uh, opioid pain relievers is actually older adults, uh, well, middle-aged to older adults, uh, and of course, younger adults as well. But 45 to 55, this is uh, the range at which uh, that overdose death is most likely. So if we compare 1999 to 2014, these are the deaths per 100,000, very isolated, um, and then now it's a, a pandemic uh, across much of the rural parts of the United States. So if you look, uh, this region right here, um, the Appalachians have seen really huge problems in this area. And then you can also see um, lots of rural areas uh, as well. So some reactions to the increase in opioid misuse. So some attempts to try to sort of solve this problem. Um, changes in clinical terms or status, we talk about opioid use disorder um, or addiction arising from medical treatment we call prescription opioid use disorder. So um, we're sort of waiting for some regulatory guidance, but the FDA Safety and Innovation Act and the 2011 Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan from the Office of National Drug Control Policy call for some FDA guidance. And so we really need some better um, top-down regulation in this area. And so there is some effort being made in these areas. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we've turned to now is um, there are a number of lawsuits against uh, the companies that make these drugs and even some of the individuals involved. Um, so here's some sort of draft uh, language for uh, deterrent use. So physical and chemical barriers I talked about a minute ago to prevent chewing, crushing, grinding, or extraction with water or alcohol, uh, some agonist-antagonist combinations that will block that euphoria but get the pain effect. Um, aversion, that is to try to reduce pleasant effects as doses increase. Uh, delivery systems um, that might make this better. Um, some prodrugs, which have to be transformed in the GI tract, so they have to be swallowed, um, so they couldn't be crushed, snorted, or injected or some combination of these. So these are some potential deterrent formulations for keeping people from abusing these drugs. Uh, there's certainly a lot of collateral damage from opioid abuse. Uh, HIV infections from needle sharing uh, are on the rise. In Anderson, Indiana, uh, we saw a huge outbreak in one year, uh, and these tend to be uh, linked to needle sharing. One of the big problems we see is that um, needle exchanges are often illegal or it's even illegal to possess needles, and so it makes it harder to get clean needles, uh, and that's a huge problem. And so one of the things we have to watch for is trying to um, come up with harm reduction uh, tactics, so providing clean needle exchange for HIV, 
potentially getting these uh, users on um, Truvada, which is an HIV prevention drug. Um, and then hepatitis C infections is another issue from that needle care. So, uh, some harm reduction, things like um, needle exchanges, more widespread availability of naloxone. In some places, it's available without a prescription. Uh, providing safe injection sites. This has worked in a number of countries uh, that provide uh, safe injection sites supervised by medical personnel. And oftentimes those people who come to these safe injection sites are then far more able and far more likely to get help or even uh, are able to sort of slow down their injection use and come off the drugs um, by simply reducing use over time. We certainly need increased availability of treatment programs using the best evidence-based practices. And that's where um, some of the drugs we're going to talk about next uh, come from is this evidence-based programs. So current evidence suggests pharmacotherapy using either methadone or suboxone with supportive psychotherapy is the best option. Um, without medication assistance, many people cannot work or live in the community. And so this combination of pharmacotherapy with supportive psychotherapy is our best bet. Now, a lot of people oppose this um, idea because they say you're replacing one drug with another. You're replacing one drug with one that isn't going to kill you, and also that you have the potential to step down off of eventually. At least that's the hope. Problem is some people sort of then end up on Spoxone forever, um, but it's better than the alternative. So methadone maintenance programs, the goals are to re rehabilitate the dependent person, reduce needle association uh, disease, illicit drug use, and the crime associated with it. The best predictor of success is the maximal dose. That is, programs that prescribe doses of greater than 100 milligrams daily have higher retention rates than those that restrict doses to less um, amounts. So at 160 milligrams a day, about one-thirds of non-holders uh, on a once daily schedule. These tend to be rapid metabolites, so we tend to have to have higher um, these programs reach only about 20% of the dependent persons in the U.S. Oftentimes, they're limited in terms of the numbers of people they can see. They're almost always located somewhere that's inconvenient um, because people are um, so afraid of having a methadone clinic in their area. Uh, again, it's quite controversial. It requires daily visits to a clinic, and so it's that. That's a big problem. It Suboxone, which is buprenorphine and naloxone. The buprenorphine component controls withdrawal symptoms, and the naloxone component blocks the effects of any of the opioid drugs, which eliminates the potential for overdose or reabuse. So this, I think, is a terrific drug. It can be taken as a pill. Uh, blocks those withdrawal symptoms, but also if somebody um, relapses and um, abuses, they're not going to get anything out of it because the naloxone is going to block that. This has been shown to be highly effective. Uh, very recently, um, a study demonstrated that um, CBD might be successful in reducing the craving for a drug and the anxiety associated with drug use. Um, they found in this particular case, and this is a um, CBD product that is available in the U.S. for uh, treating epilepsy, that it was effective in reducing heroin users' craving and anxiety responses to drug-related disease. What they did in this study is they brought in um, users. And one of the things that happens when you provide um, abuse-related cues, a needle, and all the apparatus associated with um, using heroin, um, oftentimes it will induce craving. And they found that this particular product uh, was successful in uh, relieving that particular um, craving. So uh, that is it for our introduction to opioids and uh, their dependence and treatment. Uh, for more information, uh, these guides are certainly um, great places to turn to, lots of resources available. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, other types of drug treatment, non-steroidal inflammatory drugs, uh, and uh, other, options, other options for